Hello everyone, welcome to 2018 Fall Dyslexia Summit. Our guests today are Kate Mayer and Jamie Lynch. They're parent advocates whose mission is not only to help parents guide through the reading journey, but more importantly, support parents educate the educators. Welcome Jamie and Kate, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Kate, uh, I'd like to start with you. Um, you have, you're a mom of five two of which are dyslexic and possibly a set of two-year-old twins that will be uh, diagnosed as well. So you have a very diverse background. You have experience in Silicon Valley startups, technology companies, and also in public education. You also served on the founding um, board of an all-girls public charter school for seven years. And now you're on a mission to impact uh, reading change within public schools. So before um, we uh, go back to Jamie, maybe you can tell us about your story a bit. So um, yeah, I, I have five children um, and I came to this mission when my first uh, oldest son was diagnosed with dyslexia um, about six years ago. Um, I was a parent at that point um, and, and approaching this journey from a parent perspective, but I also had been an educator and always in the back of my mind was this piece where I thought, or, or knew that I hadn't served my students appropriately. Uh, the dyslexic students and then kind of throughout the process or on this journey, I realized most of my students because I hadn't been taught how to teach reading um, from the science of reading. I learned a lot of things about how to make my uh, students and children lovers of literature and um, very rich, have very rich vocabularies, um, but I didn't learn how to teach them the, the mechanics of reading and, and it was, not my fault. Um, it was, you know, I, I went to San Francisco State University um, for my teaching credential, and um, it wasn't part of the program. And we had phenomenal um, teachers, and, and, and um, however, um, it just wasn't part of the program. So um, when my second son was diagnosed, um, and when we moved to Pennsylvania, and I had been in a couple different high-income um, school districts that were rated really, really well, I realized that this um, problem was prevalent. Um, and it was not, it was common, um, more common than not. Um, so that's how I got on this journey. Um, and I will say that um, I have five children, two of whom have been diagnosed as dyslexic, one who is not. However, when she learned to read, she did not learn to read easily or effortlessly. And she required um, instruction based in the science of reading that we got outside of school. And I'm assuming that, you know, one of my two twins would pro will probably have um, a dyslexic profile just by sheer um, statistics. Um, so that's my story. <laughs> Thank you for sharing it. Um, and Jamie, you're a mom of three and one of your children has dyslexia and you have a background in English literature. So you are passionate about providing a rich literary, uh, literary environment for your kids from the time they were born. And yet you found out that um, you know, the, the schools uh, often and teachers are not aware of what dyslexia is, as Kate was just mentioning, and how it can impact not only a child's academic progress, but of course, uh, their confidence and their emotional well-being, which is something that I'm very passionate about. So you started spending your free time exploring professional resources regarding the science of reading, and I'm sure we'll talk a lot about that in the coming minutes. And, um, and you became an active parent uh, advocate as well because you want to ensure all children become uh, readers. And I, I love your organization's passion. And I'd, like to, I'd love to start with your connection to dyslexia as well. And then maybe we can go into the mission. Sure. Um, so my son, uh, when he was in kindergarten, uh, we found out that he didn't pass the basic screener um, and that he wasn't making all the connections to the sounds that we thought he was. And um, so we started asking some questions and um, I just asked about dyslexia because could that possibly be it? That's something we've all heard of when we talk about reading. And I was told that dyslexia didn't exist. That's not what we call it anymore. And so I was really confused. And so I went and started doing some research and I found likely, because a lot of the things, the first place I went was the Yale um, Center for Dyslexia, and a lot of the things made sense to me, um, and I could connect to them. And so then um, I started asking some questions, and I didn't get the answers that made sense to me, so I had to do a little bit more digging. 
um, which really started the whole process of understanding that I had to be a mini expert in this to help my son get what he needed. Um, so then we also, like Kate, went outside um, of the school for pri privately and um, augmented his education with tutoring um, and summer programs and things like that to get him to read on grade level. And, um, and he excelled in those programs. Once he received the instruction that was working for him, uh, then he did really well. Um, so that's it. So maybe we can talk about your organization and your mission, which really is um, you want to educate parents to educate the educators. Yes. So um, our mission is to ensure that all students in the Tradition East Town School District learn to read to, to the best of their potential with as little emotional impact as possible by using instructional practices based in the science of reading. And what we know is that um, there is a science and there has been years and years of research that tells us how the brain works, how the brain learns to read, in what order, what steps kind of happen even behind uh, without us knowing those steps are occurring. And if, if you have a problem at any one of those steps, then it can impact reading. So, so if we have an instructional, instructional practice that's based in those steps, then we can find out where students might be struggling, what areas need to be reinforced, and they all get this systematic explicit instruction. It's not something that needs to, um, I, I think the, the flip side is that a lot of our educational programs are focused in rich literacy, and those are great important things too. Um, however, our kids uh, can't just absorb how to read, the skill of reading from just being exposed to that background. And, and I will, I'm gonna jump in and, and that it's not that all kids can't do that. About 40% of kids can learn with any type of instruction. So they can be put into a classroom where there is not explicit, explicit systematic um, and sequential instruction and they'll be fine. And, and when you meet one of them or if you are one of them, um, and you have a child or, a, or a, 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 a someone who, who doesn't learn that way, it can be confusing. It can also be confusing for teachers yes. um, because they are taught that this presenting children with literacy rich environments is appropriate. So I think that's, um, but, but for the other 60% of kids, um, there's a continuum of, of in, how intense the instruction needs to be but those kids need the systematic explicit instruction to be proficient readers or to read to the best of their ability. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of kids along the way, especially in a district like ours, where they, they are learning to read, but the process is frustrating mm -hmm. and their ability to read is not where it could otherwise be with the right instruction. And so that frustration can cause like what Jamie said, anxiety, um, stress, all sorts of things that happen apart from the reading piece. And so that's where we're focusing on kind of making sure all kids get what they need in terms of reading instruction. So your organization really goes beyond that 10 to 20 percent of dyslexic kids, but also those kids who can benefit from explicit reading instruction. And the reason we do that is because we really feel that, and, and we've talked to lots of, we have amazing teachers in our, our district who really care about our kids. Mm -hmm. And they become frustrated sometimes when they can't help a child. And so we know that if we can help them have the resources to be able to help kids, that it will impact all kids positively. So it's important, yeah. Even the kids, even the who, kids. who learn to read easily are be benefit from this type of instruction. So I think it creates a broader knowledge across, across all places because sometimes kids are found in kindergarten with dyslexia, but it's much more likely it's third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade that they're not recognized as having dyslexia. And if you have that rich knowledge across the, the whole district, then all of the teachers will be able to work with each other and be able to figure out the puzzle. That's true. So if you go into the uh, intervention, so what's the, the goal of intervention is to really support the children who need it. So how does like reading instruction and intervention uh, in schools work? So in general, the way we've seen um, reading instruction in schools work, what we know is that in all schools, uh, 
the schools are trying to do their best mm -hmm. and they have best intentions. Um, a lot of times with the general education and in intervention programs, um, what, what there are constraints and those constraints can be systematic um, or um, they could be because of lack of knowledge of the science of reading. But in general, the biggest um, constraint we find or that, that we feel that comes up the most is just this uh, one of finances or, or um, funding. Um, so a lot of times when you talk about making changes or, or um, you, when we start talking about this stuff, we hear administrators or even teachers saying, well, we can't train everyone in Wilson or we can't have certified instructors in, in OG. And um, in general, for the entire system, what, what we believe for the entire system to work effectively or efficiently would be to, to truly train teachers in the science of reading so they have the tools in their toolbox to um, look at what they're using and to um, apply it appropriately um, at, at every level. However, what we see because of this lack of resources and lack of understanding, what's happening now um, is that there are systems in place that are sort of based on the science of reading mm -hmm. because we've had this RTI come up and um, MTSS um, process come up, but they're not um, being um, uh, executed according to the science. So what that looks like is most schools, um, we found public schools especially, yeah. use uh, universal screening tools, mm -hmm. um, you know, in elementary school to identify kids who might have a reading need. And that's how they filter kids um, into an intervention system. The way it's supposed to work is that once you kind of identify these kids who have possible needs um, through universal screening and teacher feedback, I think is the other one, then you group them according to their specific needs. Um, the way you do that is by using diagnostic tools, assessments to identify those needs. Um, what we've found is that it, it stops before that usually. Usually the kids are grouped, they're put into to different small group, groups, sometimes smaller than, uh, you know, some are bigger than others, and then they're given instruction. Um, and I'll jump in here yeah. because sometimes when um, that RTI model where kids are, are given the, for the smaller group instruction, um, the important piece is that they're given instruction in a way that, they, that works for them. So mm -hmm. they need the science of reading. So some, sometimes it's not uncommon for um, schools to put kids in the smaller groups, but they still receive the same instruction that wasn't working for them. So if we kind of back up and we look at it at a tier one perspective for everybody in, in all of the classes, mm -hmm. they all get the science of reading together. Then for those kids who needed more because they're still having a hard time, those kids move to the same kind of curriculum, mm -hmm. um, but get it in a smaller group. And that's really the idea of RTI. I don't think that's what's been put in place. And I think that's part of one of the problems. Um, that we've seen for the kids. And RTI means response to intervention. Um, and it's it's a, a, a synonym for MTSS, which we use in Pennsylvania where we are. It's multi-tiered system of supports. Um, and that's just a, a framework for offering these interventions that we're talking about. And I think two other important components of the, this framework, which are sometimes executed currently in, the, in, in most schools or some schools, um, are progress monitoring, so kids are grouped in intervention, and what's supposed to happen is progress monitoring is supposed to be used to determine whether or not that intervention is working. And it can, progress monitoring is a, a series or some sort of quick check, norm reference um, check that um, lets the teacher and, and, and the team know if, if they're making a quick enough response to what's happening. So if you're giving a kid an intervention and they're not growing as they should, so we'll use fluency as an example. Um, if they're not growing a number of words per week, um, a certain number of words per week, the, the assumption uh, based on research is that they're not making appropriate growth and that intervention should be changed. Um, and then there's a, like an important piece, um, I know you were curious about, um, it's important that there's enough data within that process of um, progress monitoring to understand what that trend is. So sometimes it's not uncommon for kids only to be measured towards the end of a marking period that we've seen. But true progress monitoring would be at regular intervals and depends on the severity of the need. So, um, but a really normal schedule would be a weekly schedule for a child um, to receive progress monitoring so that you then have 
seven to eight data points within two months and you can say, okay, this, we don't want to spend more time doing this. We need to make that change because we can see it's not working for this child. And the last piece is that parents are supposed to be given that information yeah. um, and be part of the team so that they, what we found in our district is that parents don't always get that information. And because we are a, 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 in re, a, a more resource rich um, district, parents have the means to go out and get the help they need for their children. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they, if their child's put in intervention, they might go get a tutor, but they get the wrong tutor because they don't know what the area of need is. For instance, there's a dyslexic kid getting pulled out for intervention and the mom or dad go out and, and get the tutor recommended by the school. And again, it's the same instruction that they're getting in school instead of the you know, OG or um, you know, some other um, program that they really need. Mm -hmm. And so by sharing that information, the, the, the goal is to share the information so all the team members can participate and help this kid grow to the point where you know they're a successful reader and they're able to go back into the general ed classroom 100% of the time. And I think that's another piece too that um, is often talked about, um, and I know it's common, um, I've seen it, where as soon as the child is meeting either a benchmark or, or a progress monitoring goal, they're removed from that intervention, that smaller group that's, that's not working, or that's working, and put back into the the tier one, mm -hmm. and then they kind of start to lose because they're not getting the instruction that was making them grow. So it's really important to understand what those pieces were and where they fell apart so that you could give that to them. If, if you have tier one instruction with science of reading, if they come back into the classroom, they're still going to be supported in the way that it was intended. They don't need to be in that intervention forever. Mm -hmm. um, in some places that that tier two intervention looks like the science of reading and general education does not. So, so what can happen to a child is they can be going along in a regular classroom and they're not really growing, but they get into intervention, that becomes effective, they grow, they go back, and then they kind of fall down again. Um, so making that consistent all the way through the tiers so that it works um, solidly for kids is really important for us. And I think for parents, what I would say about progress monitoring um, is that it's important for parents to know that trust your gut. Kids, your, your child needs to grow and they need to make up the gap. And so if you're sitting in a meeting or you're talking to the team and they're saying, oh, it's okay, you know, she's grown even though she hasn't caught up. Our, our goal is good, you know, trust your gut. The growth for a kid in intervention, re receiving intensive intervention, is, is different than the growth of a regular child in the general ed classroom. And in order to catch up to their peers, they must make incredible progress. And it does happen with the right instruction. And you probably know that having dyslexic, dyslexic child, that when they get the right intervention, you see it and you say, wow, look at how great that is. But a lot of times when we're working with these teams who haven't had the background in the science of reading, mm -hmm. there's a... It's a res again a resource thing. It's you know we're going to get them to where we can, and um, that's enough. And yes. parents trust your gut. It's not enough. There's more that can be done, and um, you know keep keep charging. <laughs> <laughs> I do hear that, and sometimes schools say this is meaningful progress, but that's really not reaching to the kids' potential. It's, you know progress is not always. Um, you're showing progress doesn't always mean that that is really the full potential that child can read at. Yeah, and I think some, I think a problem with progress, meaningful progress, that, that can be confusing mm -hmm. is that often parents, and that's a term usually used around special ed, right? Mm -hmm. So um, when parents have a child placed in special ed, sometimes they have this idea that their child is going to be in special ed until they catch up to on grade and they're, they're going to be pulled out. But, mm -hmm. but sometimes what happens in special ed allows that child to go above, you know, they, it doesn't have to be just making on grade. It's that, that that program is working for that child and then that's what they continue with. So it doesn't need to come out, um, it, you don't need to come back out of that special ed program to be placed back in the program that wasn't working for you. And um, so meaningful progress is a, um, it's also a, a com uh, something that's much up for debate in the special ed world, as we know, currently. 
um, what that means to courts because all of this is decided at the court level um, and then filters down to how everybody interprets it. That's true. So uh, if there are parents out there who suspect that um, there's an issue with their child's reading, so what would you recommend the steps that they would take? And okay, if you said follow your gut, and I'm so big on that one. If you, know, if you feel like something is off, then you know, as parents, I think we have to pursue you know, trying to understand what it is, become our child's advocate, and if needed, as you said, educate the educators to really understand um, you know, how they can help our children. So uh, what do you recommend that um, to the parents start with and what are the steps that they can go eventually to get the help their child needs? Uh, well, so on our website, um, tereads.com, we have some resources under our parent page, um, including some questions that parents can take and ask their teachers so they can start to understand um, a little bit more solidly what exactly um, is the area of weakness for the child and why they're not reading um, and begin to understand where the school is and what the, they can help them with. Yeah, and I, and I would say that um, number one is don't wait till your child fails because that is um, an, something that even the best intentioned teachers can sometimes tell parents. So I'll just give you an anecdotal kind of like message that parents sometimes get. They have a kindergartner who comes in um, and is like borderline on the benchmarks, not quite failing, you know, in terms of needing intervention. Um, and they say, oh, Johnny's a boy, he'll catch up. Don't worry, I see this all the time. Um, and, and that parent thinks to themselves, well, Johnny's been reading books with me for, for five years and Johnny knows all about the solar system and can, and can you know, when you read him a story, he comprehends the whole thing. This is weird. He's not acquiring these, these skills as quickly as he acquires other skills. That's the gut feeling. Mm -hmm. And trust it and move on it quickly, especially when you're, you're feeling that in kindergarten because both, at least Jamie actually did it. I waited, I, I was a teacher, so I went in not wanting to um, rock the boat and not want to be a know-it-all teacher. You know, like my, my husband gave me very clear directive in the beginning, don't go in and tell him you're a teacher. You know, so I did, I stepped back until second grade, watching my child who was slowly but surely developing an incredible anxiety problem, low self-esteem, you know, so trust your gut and then do what Jamie said. We have this list of questions on our website that are specific to our district, but also um, would be a place to start. And it's really speaking to the teacher and asking questions about the data. And your data might be different, but there, there are, you know, our, um, most public school systems follow a similar um, model. So, um, you know, you can ask about benchmarks, universal screening, progress monitoring. You can use those terms and see what you get in response. It's funny, you'll, you'll get an idea of whether or not it, there's a rich intervention program, yes. depending on how those questions are answered. And you can also dig into the website of your district, and some districts do a great job of describing what that stuff is, and some districts don't. Um, and then dig deeper, mm -hmm. keep asking questions, keep a record of everything, because you never know where you're gonna get. I mean, it's unfortunate that we have to say that, but a lot of times this ends up being a special education thing, and there are, um, you know, unfortunately kind of legal pressures on both sides of the special education, you know, uh, equation, the parents and the school, which make things a little sticky. And um, so document everything in your email, keep all your, your, your benchmarks in a folder. Um, and then the last thing that I think we recommend to parents who we see, um, most of the time they can afford this. It's unfortunate because, and this is one of the reasons we're in this um, yes. under this working for this mission is we tell parents to get a tutor immediately. Yes. We just say, don't wait, don't wait. you know, interview tutors, find out if they know what, what the science of reading is by asking, can you explain what the science of reading is? You might get an answer talking about systematic, explicit, um, sequential instruction, or you might get an answer like, Vocabulary comprehension. Um, literacy yes. rich environments, read to your child a lot, then I'd move on to find someone else, especially in the early grades. But what we found is that we, we help a lot of parents. And we've yes. probably talked to over 30 or 40 parents in our district just in the past year. Yes. Um, and we always say the same thing, and many of them don't do it right away. And sometimes people can't. And because that's can't the it, yeah. And that's, that's the other piece is um, for us why we want it 
for everybody because we do believe that educators want this also and it's yes. just um, a disconnect of the research that's known in higher education um, on that side and the practice where it gets disseminated to teaching programs and that's that's not the teacher's fault that's not the district's fault but we're trying to get those places put together quickly because we know for kids time is so important and the earlier you catch a child that's having difficulty the less impact it will have on them as far as their academic outcome and their emotional outcome their confidence their ability to feel like they can achieve things right. and i say you know kindergarten is better than second grade second grade is better than fifth grade fifth grade is better than high school high school is better than college and college yeah. is better than being an adult and still not understanding why they're struggling in the workplace. I mean, it's, it's never too late. I think, you know, whatever stage the ch children are, or even as adults, you know, they could be in a uh, environment where if they're feeling like, you know, this is something they need to look into, I yes. think we should do it to get the answers and make the connections. Yes. yes. And there are free or low cost resources in many areas for tutoring. So that, I mean, there's a lot of information out there about that, but that's one thing that we also try to direct parents to as well. Yes. And I, I think decoding dyslexia has been a great resource for many parents to find those resources in their state. Yes. And I'll make sure that uh, your website is uh, in the links below and also I'll put decoding dyslexia's website as well for those who are interested. Okay, great. And so, something that I've seen on your website is um, you actually talk about some of the key areas of uh, that school should be testing during the assessment. And uh, not, I know not everybody is, not, is familiar with the terminology. I know I wasn't when I first started and I found it really confusing. So maybe we could take a few minutes just before we uh, wrap it up to explain um, what they are and why they're important. Maybe we can start with phonemic awareness. Sure. Um, so phonemic awareness is sometimes confusing. Um, Phonemic awareness is the awareness of the individual of sounds. So phonemic awareness is sounds. It's nothing to do with letters, what's put, not put on the page. So it's, it's when a child learns to read and say, for example, the word cat, it has three sounds. K -a -t. Does the child, is the child able to discriminate between those three sounds? Um, and that ability to discriminate between those sounds is highly correlated to their success in reading. And can be directly instructed. So there can be instruction in phonemic awareness. It's again, not something that, some kids do not just acquire that skill. And how is that different with uh, phonics and decoding? So phonics is the connection of the sound to the letter on the page. Mm -hmm. So with phonics, you look at the letter and you make a sound. Mm -hmm. so that's the next piece, but you can't do that without phonemic awareness. Mm -hmm. right. And then decoding is putting it all together mm -hmm. um, to read words fluently. So um, uh, putting the letter sounds together to make words um, Automa 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 automatically. And then fluency is, of course, comes with decoding. Right. Yes, and fluency is um, the... Um, the, it's the, the, the ability to read text um, in, in an effortless way. Um, and a lot of times fluency is used as a universal screening tool. Um, there's a lot of research behind why they use it. It can predict comprehension skills. It can, you know, it can, it, it can predict a lot of things. Um, so if a kid is fluently reading um, at a certain level, the, 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 their ability to continue to grow is predicted. Yes. You listed the vocabulary as well, and I don't see that often. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, so back, vocabulary is really the background knowledge the child has, and there could be other reasons. So one of the reasons might be what they were exposed to at home, what kinds of vocabulary, um, if families read, if they hear stories, mm -hmm. um, those types of things. So they get exposed to other vocabulary than just the conversations at home, and also including the conversations at home. Um, the, it, but there can also be uh, um, a difficulty with vocabulary it can also indicate other difficulties that would impact reading like auditory processing. Mm -hmm. So that, um, that's just another area. So looking at all the areas is really important. Um, and comprehension, 
um, is also in the same, you know, the ability to comprehend something is based on the ability to understand the words that we are being given. And, and the compre comprehension is the end goal, right? So mm -hmm. we can have fluent readers who don't comprehend and, and we wouldn't consider them to be uh, proficient readers, um, but they need all the pieces together to, be, to, to yes. comprehend. Um, what, what we see a lot and what our, with our children, they didn't have weaknesses in the vocabulary and comprehension piece. They simply had weaknesses in the, um, in the phonemic awareness and phonics piece, phonics and fluency pieces. So that's where, you, that's where you start to see or hope to see that these areas are identified and, and articulated by mm -hmm. teachers and administrators and special, you know, by everyone so that they, they can be specifically targeted. Um, sometimes a kid has weaknesses in all areas, mm -hmm. um, and, and we, you would want to know that as a parent. One of the things we learned that I think was pretty, we went to a conference at Westchester University on the TILS assessment. I don't remember what the acronym stands for, um, but when we were there, I think it was the first time we realized, aha, um, <laughs> if a child has really good listening comprehension, mm -hmm. um, you know, in kindergarten, th they're probably not going to have a reading comprehension problem if they can decode. So you wouldn't want your kindergartner going off to intervention where they're working on all five areas, right? You want them to focus that time specifically on decoding because they don't need help with comprehension. They can benefit from being in the regular classroom, you know, with the regular content when it comes to comprehension and vocabulary um, and really focus that time on the decoding. And, and you know, it's efficient and, and uh, doesn't frustrate the kids. And, and you, and, 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 yeah. you know, and um, so to tie into that is, sometimes kids are given a comprehension assessment and, and they'll say, oh, but they were low in comprehension. But the reason they were low in comprehension is because they're spending a lot of energy to do the decoding, to do that fluent reading. So they did all of the work and they sounded everything out and they got done and they had to think like, what did I read? Um, and then they had to go back and read it again to get the comprehension. So that is sometimes, you have to really, pick apart where the area of weakness is. So you may not need to focus on comprehension at all if it's phonemic awareness. And I would say if your child has an IEP for a specific learning disability and reading, that these are questions that you really want to ask the team. Where is the weakness? What are you doing to intervene? What is the progress on that specific area or goal? Um, a lot of times a kid's, kid will just have a fluency goal and there won't be an identified need specifically you know, articulated and parents can't keep track of whether or not the, the intervention is working. And so I would really say, you know, especially if your kid has an IEP and a team who's focused on this, these are areas that you can um, begin to ask questions and ask for information about. Yes. And the last piece you have on your website is the writing and spelling and coding. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, <laughs> very dear to, I think, all of our hearts. So, so, so that piece is, is you know, um, one that we yes. haven't seen executed as um, there's a lot of science behind it, um, less science, but, yes. um, but we have not seen in our experience um, a great, um, we, we've seen some good people talk about it and talk about things to use when it comes to writing interventions. We have not seen a good system for supporting that piece. Um, we both have, um, we have several children of our own who are, that's where their, um, their weaknesses lie now um, and where we um, unfortunately haven't really, um, yes. you know, we, we don't have a lot of information. We would say that we don't see things working really, really well in that but, area. But what we do know from reading is that, yes, the, the structured um, teaching of writing is really important for our kids um, because for the same reason they didn't just automatically absorb reading, uh, it seems to be the same that they need more direct, specific instruction in writing. Uh, and lots of repetition yes. and practice. Yes. And I would say if you have a child who's in a writer's workshop classroom, mm -hmm. um, where they learn what common. good readers do, or good writers do, um, a lot of times it can be really difficult for uh, the dyslexic child or the child who needs systematic, explicit instruction. Um, and, and we've both experienced that yes. um, with our kids. So um, I, I'm struggling with the, you know, writing and spelling and encoding in our household too. 
So um, I, I have two mixed feelings about this, and I, I agree with you. I really haven't found that magic bullet that could just give the support my son needs. But, you know, half of my heart says, well, you know, we have so much technology that, you know, writing and spelling is not as maybe important as the top things that we have mentioned. And then my other, other part of my heart says, well, you know, his writing also affects other things because there's so much energy just drained. You know, it affects, um, you know, writing, you know, sh even short things that will be, you know, life skill, hopefully, that he can master. It affects his math because he has to put his explanations on. So it's just one of those things that I'm, I, again, I agree with you. I haven't found that wonderful program that will make the same difference as, um, you know, what we have found with, um, with reading. But then I'm, I'm kind of torn between saying um, it, and maybe people are not putting the resources in there as much as the other ones because technology is moving to, to a point where, you know, reading, writing, spelling isn't that effective. I mean, yeah. I hear from lots of parents who have kids with, you know, with you know, great reading skills and they're like, so um, Alexa, how do you spell this? <laughs> yeah, well, and I think, I think that that, w that is totally true. I think mm -hmm. what, what we, we should say is we've seen things that work in the research says repetition and practice work. So when kids are little and we, you find out they have this weakness in reading, it's really important to make sure that the handwriting is focused on and practice daily um, at a time where it's uh, age appropriate. So they don't feel that they're, you know, um, uh, kind of an outcast because right. they're practicing handwriting. Um, but repetition over and over. I have a, a fourth grader who's being asked to do cursive and he's being sent home homework for in cursive and he hasn't learned how to do it. So he might have had a day in third grade for each letter, yeah. but he didn't have the daily practice. And even though he has a significant weakness in, in his handwriting in general, had he done that all year last year on a daily basis, mm -hmm. it would have been easier. Yes. Um, and that piece would take away some of the cognitive demand that he's taking to, to, to actually do the physical act of writing and give him that to look at his spelling and to, to ask the question, you know, so. I and it's also like the fluent, like the ability to be fluent and get your ideas out. Like my son is highly verbal, you know, has fabulous ideas and he wants to express them. And I think when he's writing, it becomes so laborious, the process that he ends up cutting short some of his ideas and not elaborating where I think it would really help him, you know, to be more expressed. That, that is so true. Yes. Well, thank you so much for your time today. This was so valuable. Thank um, you. I'm hoping that our viewers will enjoy listening to this as much as I did. And I'll make sure that all the links are below. And, um, and I, uh, I'll share your website, which has so many re valuable resources that hopefully they can take to their, uh, their districts and maybe even start their own organizations and inspired by you. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone can reach out to us. Yes. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks. you so much. Bye-bye.